So, it's rainy. Everybody just ate, so it's time for a nap, right? So maybe I can keep y'all awake for just a few minutes while we take, talk about those things that are true. So the opening statements of Paul's letter to the saints in Philippi challenge, challenge them to stand fast, he said in Philippians 4.1. And the outline that I put in the book at the very beginning from Bobby Liddell was truly, to me, on point with this final charge feeling that I get from this scripture. He breaks it down like this, that the Apostle Paul taught them to stand fast in brotherly love, verse 1, stand fast in the Lord in the same mind, verse 2, stand fast in the Lord working together, verse 3, stand fast in the Lord rejoicing in him, in verse 4, Stand fast in the Lord in gentleness and confidence, verse 5. And stand fast in the Lord in prayer, not, and not care or not worrying, in verse 6. And then verse 8, stand fast, or 7, verse, stand fast in the Lord in the peace of God. And then verse 8, stand fast in the Lord in proper thinking. And finally, verse 9, stand fast in the Lord following Paul's example. So in this framework, verse 8 stands out very clearly as a charge, a challenge, a final charge to their way of thinking. And so this, the last ladies class, I thought that this could be our final charge, our challenge, that we can think about these verses, this verse and think on those things that are true. Think on those things that are um, honest, true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. Those things should be what we spend our time on, focus on, and energy on every day. We have to prioritize so that these things are our focus. Paul writes, think on these things. And the first in that list is true. We're to think on or focus on whatever is true. The King James Version has 81 instances where the word true is used, and then 235 times where the word truth is found. So what is true? Well, to be true, defining it anyway, um, means to be real, to be genuine, to be authentic. Also, it can be used as being sincere, based on fact, not emotion, and not at all deceitful with the facts. So telling the truth. My mom always said, be true to yourself, be true to your friends, be true to who you are, but always be true to God. Joshua challenged the Israelites to make a choice in their service to God in Joshua 24, 14, and 15. He says, serve him in sincerity and truth. And then he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. So being true to ourselves, true to other people around us, being a sincere pure Christian and genuine in our actions are just some of the examples of how we can be true in our character. Brother Liddell also wrote, true means true in every aspect of character. You can't choose to be true one day and not be true another day and think that people are going to look at you as a true person, as, as being truthful. So as far as the Word of God, we can know that it is true. It is the truth. Psalm 25.10 says, All paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. John 17.17 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then 1 John 5.20 tells us that God is true and Christ is true. Paul sums up all the ways to keep a healthy mind or a pure mind in this one verse. He tells us where to focus and on what to focus. And, you know, our mental health is something that we must take care of. We must examine ourselves and think about, are we prioritizing things in our life with the right focus? Parker Palmer wrote, self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer to others. So this reminder also comes from chapter 2 of Philippians where um, Paul says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, 
but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So with that in mind, what's on your mind? What is it that we're focused on? What are the things that we spend our time on? How do we find peace in this life? What are we thinking on each day? Many of us make to-do lists. I know I do. I'm a list maker. Sometimes it's on my phone. Sometimes it's written down on my desk or whatever. But those lists help me to keep my priorities straight. And when I'm going about doing my daily activities, I have a list of things that I have to get done. I try to sit down on Sunday nights and plan out the week. And I try to sit down at the beginning of a month or like at the end of a month and fill my calendar out and share it with Wayne so he knows what's going on in my life and he shares with me. But it's so easy to do that, but that helps us to prioritize. Um, and you know, you could, you could do things like make things in red to make it more important and stuff like that. But while I was writing this lesson, it occurred to me I need to have that spiritual to-do list. I need to have those things that I'm supposed to be focusing on and prioritize those. Those need to be the red things, right? So we prioritize each day, whether it's in our mind or whether we're writing it down. We are making things a priority. Whatever our focus is, whatever we do each day, those are our focus. That's our priority. That's what we're thinking on. So when Paul wrote to this to the Philippians, he was guiding them to have a different focus. What is our approach to life? Are we thinking biblically? Our thoughts do matter. Jesus taught that sin begins in our thoughts, in the heart, he said in Mark 7, 21 to 23. And while Peter in 2 Peter 1, 3 encourages us to grow in godliness, Paul taught us that we must win the battle against sin where? In our thoughts, Philippians 2, 5. So if we're to practice Philippians 4, 8, we must begin with thinking on things that are true. To do that, we have to see the why, and that you can see in verses 2 and 3 and verse 5. I found this quote on Pinterest recently. It said, take care of your thoughts when you're alone and take care of your words when you're with people. I think that's a, a quick, easy lesson for us all to keep in mind every day. Take care of your thoughts when you're alone. God knows our thoughts, but we need to keep those thoughts true and, and pure. We're not an island unto ourselves, though. We work together within the church, within our, with our Christian brothers and sisters to help one another so that we can stay strong and stand fast. Therefore, it's vital that we maintain those healthy relationships with one another, in verse 4, so that we may have that joy and peace mentioned in verse 7. Isn't that a goal that we should all have anyway? Isn't that a great goal to have that joy and peace in our lives? That should be a goal for all of us. So we're going to examine now the priority of truth. The very basis for things which are honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report Virtuous is truth. For each of these things, there has to be a standard by which their status is set. So to see this, I want to think about these questions. And I know I've said it over and over, but what is your focus? What is our focus? Where do we spend our time? There's so many things that can become a priority at any given time in our days. And I know we have work, and we have chores, and we have family, and we have all those things that must be a priority in our life. So maybe it is school, maybe it's work, maybe it's household chores. What are we giving the top priority to? What is it that we give the top place in our lives? Where is our focus? I also saw this quote, what consumes your mind controls your life. So Jesus taught that we must make the kingdom of God and his righteousness the priority, Matthew 6, and Paul taught us to seek those things which are above and to set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth, Colossians 3, 1 and 2. So what does this look like in our lives? How does your house look? Whether you're married or not, you are this temple. How does it look? Where are your priorities? What are you doing each day to make God, make his kingdom and his righteousness the priority? 
one thing I was thinking about too is how are we on the Lord's Day? On Sunday morning, how do you feel? Are you ready for worship? Is your mind thinking on those things? Are we scrambling around because we didn't go to bed early enough or we didn't get enough study that week? We hadn't studied our Bible, so we're not focused on those things. Or maybe you're trying to get a, you know, all your kids ready for worship and, and it's just a, a madhouse. And then you go and sit down for worship and where is your mind? So we need to make his kingdom and his righteousness our priority each day so that we're prepared for worship and we're prepared for life and we're helping our kids see that also so is prayer on our spiritual to-do list prayer brings us closer to god prayer is how we're going to find that peace and that joy philippians 4 7. true joy comes from being close to god through prayer and study we can have that joy as christians when we seek first God, his blessing truly flows in our lives. Glenn Hitchcock wrote an illustration or an analogy called Flowing Blessings, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, there was a beautiful lake with lots of zesty freshness. The water formed formerly had been clear, so it's this clear lake. You can imagine it's beautiful. You can almost see through the water. It's blue and, and crystal clear. Well, it, the animals would go there, people would go there, but it became green, covered with scum. The farm animals became ill from drinking the water. Finally, someone came by the lake that understood the problem. Debris collecting from the hard spring rains had stopped up the dam and, pre the, and prevented the free flow of water, not into the lake, but out of the lake. The spillway was cleared and soon the lake was fresh and clean again. So the flow in and out was necessary to keep that water pure. Doesn't the same principle apply to you and me as human beings? The blessings of life flow to you and me, but we fail to realize that most of these blessings are not meant just to flow to us, but to flow through us and, and be used for the good of others around us, especially those in need. So one such blessing, Paul said, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comfor com comforted to God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. So allowing God's blessing to flow through, forward because of you to others. Your life will either be a lesson deprived or a blessing to be prized. And then he says, go ahead, let him have his way with you. I thought that was so, such a beautiful illustration to think of the blessings that we do have because of the truth, because of keeping a pure heart, but we can't just keep those to ourselves. We have to let those blessings flow through us. So in prayer, we get close to God and it through study we get close to God, to know his truth. How do we know? How do we stay focused on things that are true? Studying God's word. We should know God's word so well that we automatically run decisions or any trouble that we're facing through the framework of his word. So we have to examine ourselves again. Am I studying God's word? Is it a priority in my life? Are we drawing out of his truth, his word, the lessons to be learned, the directions we should follow, or the answer to our needs? In order to be obedient, I must fill my mind and my heart with God's word, the truth. Whatsoever things are true must be my focus. But the truth also must be preserved, and it is up to us to keep that pr preservation of it. His word is all sufficient for our every need. We cannot mar it by the doctrines of men. You know, if you were here last night, Brother D. Berry talked about that fly that got in the potato salad. That can, if we let the doctrines of men mar our Bible, it's going to be like that potato salad that gets ruined. So um, Galatians 1, 6 to 10 talks about that marring it of the, from the doctrines of men. The only way to live in a way that we are thinking on the things which are true is to know the truth. Long before, as an apostle, long before he was known as apostle, Saul thought, remember he thought, 
He knew the truth. He thought Jesus was a fraud. He, he caused, it caused him to act on that truth that he believed in his mind. No doubt he was wrong. And then he stated the following in Acts 26, 9 to 12. He said, I verily thought within myself. Do we ever do that? We think we know something, but we really don't. <laughs> verily, I thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This, these scriptures really, it, it blows me away the things that he did to Christians, but then how he turned his life around. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, he says, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. All this he was doing because he thought he had the truth. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. He was doing all that thinking he had the truth. And then he says, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Then, when he learned the truth and literally seeing things differently, right? Paul would state that he was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, Acts 26, 19. So we have the truth. We have it readily available to us. We can have it on our phones. We can have it um, for, you can buy a Bible at Walmart. You can get, and you know, if you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. But you can get a Bible so easily. They cost about $5, I think, at Walmart. Um, you can even get them at the grocery store sometimes. But um, with that availability that we have, it also comes with responsibility. We have to learn to dwell on it, study it, so that we can stand on that truth of God's word. I want to read Psalm 1, if you want to follow along with me. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So we need to be like that tree. We need to be studying and growing and meditating day and night. <clears throat> the ungodly are not so, it says, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the, of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And then we have John 15, 7, says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And Colossians 3, 16, we know that when let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. And then there are warnings. Romans 1, 18 says, There tells us that there will be wrath for those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And Romans 1.25 says, they changed the truth of God into a lie. We would never want to be guilty of changing the truth of God into a lie and marring his word, his truth. We must make knowing God's word, the truth, a priority so that we are preserving it and so that we know that we're being obedient to it. And because we do these things, when we do these things, we can see products of the truth. So there's a special connection and bond to those who are in the truth. I love thinking about the church and the relationships and the family that we have. And 2 John 1 and 3 John 1 talk about being in the truth. When we have the truth in common, so many barriers that the world has between each other, they're just broken down. Things that usually cause division, maybe like age or money or um, race or even distance and geographical locations, all become irrelevant because you're in the body of Christ. It should become irrelevant anyway, it better. The truth connects people like nothing else in this world. As I've matured as a Christian, I've always been so amazed and grateful for those um, whom I've had relationships with who have blessed me in so many ways in my life, given me great advice and helped me and mentor me. 
I've had so many friends that I've looked up to in the way that they treat their spouse or the way that they raise their children, and they've helped me raise my boys. And I've also, in turn, become a mentor to younger women and been friends with those younger women and, and older women and all in between. It doesn't matter. We're in the church. We're a family. All of those things just fade away. But what a blessing it is that God has designed his family like that. As this family, we're to love and prefer one another. Romans 12, 10. We're to love one another in the truth. We, spare, we share this special bond together because of the truth. And we can never let that slip away. No one in the body of Christ should ever feel alone. Ever. So there's some other products of truth as well. We can have grace and mercy. Those are promised to us as products of the truth. Because of truth revealed by God and obeyed by the Ephesians, Paul wrote to them, Ephesians 2, 4 to 10, he said, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, <clears throat> that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, and by, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we have that grace and that mercy, all of those riches in grace, it says, exceeding riches. And then also we can have peace and reconciliation through the truth. Those are such blessings and products of the truth. Peace was brought between the Jews and the Gentiles together in one body by that New Testament truth. Paul continues in Ephesians 2 stating, He is our peace. He says, um, he's speaking of Christ. He says, For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them who were nigh. So he broke down that wall. We shouldn't have any walls up as the Lord's body. We should be a family. We can't have those barriers. And then in Philippians 4, 7, he says, And the peace of God... We have that peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then Philippians 4, 9 says, Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So think about what that peace, the God of peace, can do to bring people together. Think about what his, this truth can do throughout the world. He brings p peace between races, between religious differences even. They become void. If you have religious differences and you come into the church, that becomes void because people find and obey the truth. They, became, they start thinking as one. They become one through truth. So now, there's some today who take that idea of thinking on things to a whole other level. Thinking on what is true is not merely just the power of positive thinking. Um, we, we, all, we hear that so many times that, well, I'm going to talk about thinking about it and making it happen, but we'll talk about that in a second. But I don't want you to think for a minute that we should walk around as negative people. We need to be positive people. But some teach that we can never be negative. We have to be careful to be positive in our teaching and in the way that we teach in love, the way that we talk to one another. But even Christ was negative in his teaching at times. Think of how he spoke to the scribes and Pharisees. He called them hypocrites and blind guides. Some think you can't be a negative person and have peace in your life. Not a negative person, I take that back. 
Some think that you can never be negative and have peace in your life. But sometimes in teaching, there is always, there sometimes has to be a negative because of what is true. So this is where I'm talking about the name it and claim it thing. <laughs> so if you've ever heard of the religion, it's, a, it's like a religious thought that you can name it and claim it. And when I was looking through, through some of the beliefs that people have, there was one not so nice one that says they call it blab it and grab it. And I thought, wow, that's so, it sounds so silly when you think of it like that, but blab it and grab it. Mm -hmm. and, but they think that you can claim a blessing that God is offering and then have it. Like you're willing it to be in your life, not God. And so um, it's promoted by Oprah and Joel Osteen and a lot of um, other religions, but it's not taught in scripture anywhere that we can say something and it will happen anywhere. The idea that you can name it positively in faith and that God must do that, it's not true. It's not taught in scripture anywhere. And with that line of thinking, when you start thinking that you can grab it or claim it, for yourself, then you're going to fool yourself into thinking that you have the power and not God, that you have the power all by yourself to just make things happen. Now, do I believe that we should believe in our self-worth? Yes, of course. We are worthy. We should love ourselves. But to put your faith in only yourself, to believe that we can visualize what we want and will it to become reality? at the least is arrogant, and at the worst, it goes against the sovereignty and authority of God. I was once, when I first started becoming more entrepreneurial, I can't say that word, in my mind, um, I was listening to a podcast, and they advertised it as, you know, help you in your business, and so I thought, well, I'll listen to it, and I have to share this. It, it was pretty funny. The entire thing was stating things that I, they, they were saying, state what you want to happen in your life. Say it out loud. Say it over and over and start living it as if it's going on. And then it's going to happen. And I, I was like, well, if I can say all day long, I'm going to make $50,000 this month, but I can say it for a thousand times and it still wouldn't just happen. And then, of course, at the end, you know, for $99 more, we'll tell you how else to make, you know, more money, whatever. But we are not God in, in all seriousness. That, it, it's, it just is so sad that people believe these things. But we are not God to make him do anything. But we should rather recognize his greatness, his sovereignty, and his authority and humbly approach him as child, of his children and Knowing that he loves us, he wants the best for us, <clears throat> we should have those positive thoughts about our life. We should pray for those things that we need, even things we desire. We can let him know our desires. But always we must acknowledge the power of God and his will. <clears throat> Paul is simply teaching that we should be focused on, meditating upon, and be thinking on the word of God. And in doing so, we might know the truth and enjoy the products of it. Excuse me. <clears throat> the allergies are getting to me too, I think. <clears throat> so, we've talked about the priority. <clears throat> Can I have some water? Water? It's in my bag, Krista. There's some in my bag. I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right, so we've talked about the priority, the permanence. Thank you. The permanence of truth. Ah, better. So, math. Who likes math? Does anybody like math in here? Y'all are not my people. No, <laughs> no, I appreciate math, and I know that it's important. Um, I struggled with higher math, but the basic math, I was a school teacher, and I could do basic math all day long. But math... To me, in my mind, logical thinking, me, knows that there is a base for it, and it is truth. So 
it's a series of absolutes built on the knowledge that we all know what one plus one equals two. That's simple. Now my Matthew, I shouldn't have called his name, but <laughs> my son would argue about everything, especially when he was in elementary school, and he tried to argue about math one day, and, and I had to show him how it's just absolute. That's the basis. It's the basic math, one plus one equals two. But this is a foundation of truth whereby even greater math and science can be performed. So whether someone believes it or argues about it or not, it's the truth. Or whether even if all of you told me one plus one is not two, if you didn't believe it, it's still one plus one equals two. So whether it's believed by the majority or not, it is the truth. And in turn, no matter what we believe about God's word, about his will, it will not change. It cannot change the truth of God's word. We can know the truth and enjoy freedom produced by it, John 8, 32. So there are clearly those who knew the truth in the Bible. We can read about those who knew the truth and were saved by it. The apostle John wrote to the elect lady and her children and also to the well-beloved Gaius in 2 John 1 and 3 John 1. He loved them in the truth. This was something they shared together by their having followed the truth. However, there are those who teach today that you can't be absolutely sure that you know the truth. But the word of God, we can be sure. We know that it is absolute. It is eternal in its duration. The psalmist wrote, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 89. And then Isaiah said of God's word, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God, our God shall stand forever. And then in 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25, Peter says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then Peter quotes Isaiah, saying, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass, grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So from Genesis 1.1, all through scripture, we are shown an absolute, just like math, an absolute truth with evidence to back it up. Every single word. God has revealed to mankind the greatest truth for all, the redemption story. And while revealing that story to mankind through the ages, God has also given to us wonderful truths so that we know who he is, what he has done for us, and what he expects of us. We don't have to wonder that at all. He has told us. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners or different ways spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these days, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He died for us. And Paul explains by inspiration God's wonderful plan of redemption to the Ephesians. So I'm going to read, it's lengthy if you want to follow along, Ephesians 3, 1 to 14, because it lays out that plan of redemption that he wrote to the Ephesians. <clears throat> it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the, of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, whom am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, 
and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the wor world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul received these words by inspiration and wrote them down so that all these many thousands of years later, we would know the truth today. So even against all hatred, the Bible still stands. It still stands. Through the ages, there have been those who have tried to burn it, destroy it, dismiss it, and out of dislike for what it says, they've tried to change it or prove it wrong and keep its influence at bay. But it still stands and will stand to eternity. In our text, Paul wrote, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Keeping our mind pure, think on what is true. Let it be the springboard for all things honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report and virtuous in our lives so that we might be found pleasing to God. In this life, we can find those things if we follow that which is true. For those who will heed, the truth, who heed truth's warnings and follow its admonitions, they will receive those wonderful products that I mentioned of grace, mercy, peace, redemption, and freedom. These blessings that we gain from following the truth should and must be shared with others, all of those around us. <clears throat> so I challenge us, all of us, to keep our relationship strong with God, study God's word, know his word, know his truth, the truth, and take it to all the world as we're commanded. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. We really do appreciate that. Um, Cindy stressed that we need to focus. And as we bring the ladies' class to a close, um, Cindy just read it, but I'd like to read again Philippians 4, 8, which has been our theme verse for the week. Finally, and I'm going to put ladies, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate, or as Cindy said throughout her um, talk, focus on 